I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Esther as we continue on our studies in Esther tonight, looking at chapter 8, verses 1 through 17, looking at the whole chapter tonight. Esther chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Hear the word of God. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. When the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose and stood before the king, and she said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and if the thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who were in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows, because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. <clears throat> but you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king, and seal it with the king's ring, for an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. The king's scribes were summoned at that time. In the third month, which is the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day, and an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews to the satraps and the governors and the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to each province in its own script, and to each people in its own language, and also to the Jews in their script and their language. <clears throat> and he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service, bred from the royal stud, saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, women and children included, and to plunder their goods. On one day, throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, a copy of what was written was to be issued as a decree in every province, being publicly displayed to all peoples, and the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies. So the couriers, mounted on their swift horses that were used in the king's service, rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white, with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple and the city of Susa mounted and uh, shouted and rejoiced. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews, for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. <clears throat> and we give thanks to God for his word. Let's pray now and ask his help as we study it. 
Our Father, we are thankful for the Scriptures. Lord, we love your Word. We love the Bible. We love to study it, think about it, talk about it. And I pray, Father, that your Spirit would be with us as we do. Bless it to our hearts, to our lives. Lord, we would love you more because we were in your Word tonight. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Haman is dead. Mordecai is quite alive. Crisis averted, right? Well, almost, as the great philosopher oft quoted and one time catcher for the New York Yankees, Yogi Berra, once said, It ain't over till it's over. And it ain't over. Because while Esther is safe and Mordecai is in a much better place, Haman, having been hanged on the gallows he designed for Mordecai, uh, the reality is that the Jews in Persia are still very much in trouble. The sword of Haman's edict, okay, technically the king's edict at Haman's provocation, uh, that sword still hangs over the Jews of Persia. Esther has saved Mordecai. But her people, the Jews, are still very much in danger. And so in this chapter, chapter 8, Esther and now Mordecai with her work to save the Jews of Persia. Chapter falls into three parts. I want us to organize our thinking uh, in this chapter. First of all, Mordecai's promotion, and then Esther's plea, and then the Jews' joy. So first of all, then, Mordecai's promotion. You see this in 1 and 2. Uh, just part of the, the whole reversal of things. You, you recall we ended the previous chapter with Haman <clears throat> hanged on the gallows he prepared for Mordecai, and the wrath of the king abated. Uh, this really solved a problem for the king uh, with Haman and um, whatever his, as he was pleading with the queen for his life, he kind of falls upon the couch as the king comes back in. And that's all the king needs to see to have reason that Haman should be executed and it solves this whole problem that the king had, uh, what to do with Haman and the edict and all of that. However, the edict is still there. But Mordecai's promotion. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. By house, uh, I didn't mean just his, his, his abode, but his whole, uh, his whole estate, and it was common then for uh, the, the estate of a deceased person to revert to the crown, to go to the crown to be disposed of as, as the uh, royalty would see fit. Um, we see an earlier example of this actually in, 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 a, in a quite vicious one in 1 Kings 21, where King Ahab desired the property of a man named Naboth. He had a vineyard there. King Ahab wants it. Uh, Naboth won't sell it, and, and one reason he won't is because it's family ancestral land, and, and he won't sell the king's sullen and, and, and sulking, and uh, his, his wife, the evil uh, Jezebel, sees him kind of down in the dumps and asks what's wrong, and so he explains it, and uh, Queen Jezebel has Naboth falsely accused, and then put to death, unjustly executed, they essentially murdered. <clears throat> and then she says, it's yours, the land is yours. He's dead, the land goes to the crown, problem solved, according to Queen Jezebel, uh, because the property of a condemned man who's killed goes to the crown. So here it is, Haman's dead, he's been executed, so his estate goes to the king, and because it's the king's, as verse 1 says, <clears throat> he's able to give Queen Esther the house of Haman. He just gives the whole thing to her, which you may recall, Haman was a man of immense wealth. He was offering a huge sum of money to the king, essentially to bribe him to issue that first edict to get rid of all the Jews in Persia. So to say that the king gave Esther the house of Haman was saying something indeed, because it's now Esther's. And then we read, Mordecai came before the king. How did this happen? It says, for Esther had told what he was to her. Remember, earlier in the book, Mordecai said, don't, don't, don't say anything about who we are. You know? so, but now it's all getting out in the open, much more openness, less hiding. And how does King Ahasuerus react to this? 
the king took off his signet ring, which he'd taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. I don't know what Esther was expecting, but that was much more generous on the king's part. And remember, he Mordecai had saved the life of the king, so uh, he, was, he was appreciative to him for that. Um, and so just like when Queen Vashti at the beginning was fired and there was a, a, a job vacancy for a queen in the kingdom, uh, so now there's a, a vacancy at the prime minister's spot. And so who better than Mordecai, who had uh, showed loyalty by saving the king's life. So Mordecai takes over for Haman. That, could, that reversal is complete. Uh, Mordecai lives in his prime minister. Haman was prime minister and was hoisted on his own petard executed on the gallows he built for Mordecai. And because Esther, as it says now, has possession of Haman's estate, Esther set Mordecai over that estate to be essentially the executor, the manager of this estate that is given to her. <clears throat> and this, this makes Esther and, and Mordecai very, very wealthy. So the whole, the whole reversal of the situation is, is quite striking. The always unmentioned Lord, God, in his providence has not only saved Mordecai's life, but raised him to very high levels, indeed replacing Haman at that high level, indeed. And we can't help but think of, of Joseph in the book of Genesis, who goes from being sold into slavery by his brothers to falsely accused and imprisoned to very quickly rising to be second only to Pharaoh in all of Egypt. We hear Mordecai is second only to Xerxes or Ahasuerus in Persia. And now all of, this, all of this is great, but I want you to consider for a second an alternate reality. I'm doing my best Rod Serling Twilight Zone imitation, not holding a cigarette. We don't do that anymore. But back then, yeah, you know, he'd be standing. Consider, if you will, uh, an alternate reality, just kind of as a, as a mental exercise. Uh, imagine Esther right up front, instead of hiding her Jewish identity, is very open about it. That the king knows exactly who she is. Instead of hiding her connection to Mordecai, is forthright about it. This man is, 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 is like a father to me. They're cousins. He's like a, he's an uncle. You know, kind of, uh, but he raised her, as we learned earlier. What would have happened then if Mordecai had reported the assassination plot that he did and saved the life of the king? Well, if the king was already aware of Mordecai and his connection to the queen, he might have raised Mordecai to that position. Instead of weirdly, he reports that Mordecai reports the plot, like king's life is saved, next chapter Haman is raised to that position. What if this whole terrifying drama had been avoided altogether? It might have been. We don't know. I mean, God knows. There's all contingencies. But what if she'd been right up front about who she was, who Mordecai was, who her people were from the get-go? Mordecai might have been here without Haman ever having been there. Just something to think about uh, because it was in fear for her safety that Esther hid her identity and her connection to Mordecai. It was fear, but what if she was open. And actually, when she was finally open, it says she told who Mordecai was in connection to her, and the king doesn't seem to care in the least. In fact, he, he, he puts the ring on Mordecai. The king is not at all concerned, which I think there's a lesson in that. I don't know what would have happened if Esther had been right up front about her people, herself, and Mordecai. Things might have gone very differently. Sometimes we do things out of fear, uh, things that may never materialize, actually and that can actually make life more complicated. Sometimes we might keep our faith hidden when we finally do make known we're a Christian. The, the reaction may be very different from what we feared. Uh, sometimes timidity, quiet, or, or even certainly sin, just complicate things and make them worse. God brought good here out of a bad situation, but what if things had gone differently and the bad situation had never occurred at all? Something to think about. And something to remember when we're tempted to hide who we are and not just plant the flag right up front that we are Christians. At the very least, it might be more difficult to do it later on. So we have Mordecai's promotion uh, into, into this position of where Haman was, prime minister. And the second thing we see here is Esther's plea. Esther is back before the king again. Esther spoke again to the king 
It said she's very emotional. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite and the plot he had devised against the Jews. Um, I mean, everything is looking great in the first couple of verses, but then we have Esther again in tears because she realizes that edict is still out there. The people are under the sentence of death. And so she is, she is crying, weeping before the king. And it's, it's almost, to me, it strikes me almost a little bit humorous. When the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, well, she's already there. Remember, you couldn't approach the king unbidden, and if you did... Only if he held out the golden scepter would your life be spared. And Esther did that earlier in the book when she first came to the king and, and requested them to attend the banquet for another banquet and reveal what, what Haman had done, who he was. Well, here she, it looks like she just throws herself at the feet of the king, and the king is, you know, is almost he seems to be astounded to see her, and he just kind of holds out the scepter so she's not executed uh, after the fact, after she's already there. And maybe Hester realized that what she had done, but uh, it says when he did that, she rose and stood before the king. She was down at his feet. When she gets up and stands before him, presumably there at his throne, uh, her, her, the, the queenly bearing and dignity she demonstrates the first time she went before the king has is, is gone by the wayside. I mean, she, she is truly upset about what is happening. Haman, interestingly, is described here and later as the Agagite, uh, which brings to mind the ancient history of Israel. You may recall Agag uh, was an Amalekite king. Saul defeated him and the Amalekites, uh, but Saul didn't execute people. He, he kept stuff. You know, it was, it was a pretty bad scene for, for Saul, who kept saying he'd done what the Lord commanded. Samuel says, why am I hearing all these animals? You know, you didn't do it. And, uh, and Agag thinks, well, the worst is past. And then uh, it doesn't just say Samuel put Agag to death. It says Samuel hacked Agag to death before the Lord. What Saul was supposed to have done, Samuel finished the job. But it's the Agagites, these enemies of Israel, like Agag, like the Amalekites, Haman of the house of Agag, an Agagite. It's kind of fun to say if you say it fast. Agagite uh, is an enemy of Israel. And like we talked about when, when Haman, or sorry, when Mordecai was refusing to bow down to Haman, this may have been part of the reason, this ancient antipathy between the house of Agag and the Amalekites and Israel. And for Mordecai as a Jew, maybe he's aware of that, and, and that, that, that ages old hostility kept him from bowing. That may be part of it. Well, in her distress, Esther apparently forgot to wait for the golden scepter, but he does. After the fact, Esther gets up, talks to him, and makes her plea. Now, notice a couple of things here. One, she's very, uh, not only very emotional, but very deferential to the king. Um, at the same time, what she says, as before, it seems to be worded pretty carefully. Not only deferential to the king, but it appeals to him and centered on, uh, on Esther and the king's clear regard for Esther and his, his, that he likes Esther, he, he's pleased with Esther. And so it focuses on that and appeals to that and her own distress, her own heartache as one the king cares about over the state uh, of affairs with her people. Verse 5, notice the language. If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, which was a key part of her earlier argument, is the king's regard for, for the queen. And if the thing seems right before the king, and if I am pleasing in his eyes, which she is, that's why she got to be queen to start with, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the Agagite, son of Habadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear? And here's where she's appealing to her own grief as somebody the king cares about. How can I bear to see the calamity that's coming to my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Now, again, very careful. She doesn't blame the king, although technically it's his edict that has done this. It went out in his name. She's not going to point fingers at the king, but she points to Haman, who, of course, was the prime mover behind it. She also realizes she's asking the impossible. to revoke. She uses the word revoke. Uh, the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which, as the king reminds her, cannot be revoked. The king, oddly, doesn't seem to think there's a problem. I mean, Haman's the problem. We got rid of Haman. 
well, what are you so upset about? And that seems to be where he is. He says, behold, I've given Esther the house of Haman. They've hanged him on the gallows because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. I mean, the king kind of seems to think, well, didn't we fix things? Isn't everything okay now? Problem solved. But since she asks about the edict, he continues in verse 8. He says, but you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king, seal it with the king's ring, for an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. So just as he gave a blank check to Haman earlier, he gives the same blank check. And the language is, is similar to earlier with Haman. He gives a similar blank check now to Esther uh, to, to issue a new edict. She can't revoke the old one, but she can, in the name of the king, uh, write another one. So what do you do? How do you write a new edict that will somehow counter the original edict against the Jews? So, again, language very similar to with Haman earlier. They get all the king's scribes together. Under Mordecai's direction, they craft a new law here, a new edict that's to go out to all the empire. Language very similar, you know, the languages and all that, but there's a significant difference. You see it uh, in verse 9. And also to the Jews in their script and language. Since it concerns them and is for them, they also were careful to put it into their language, and that may, part of that may have come from Mordecai. I mean, it may have been Mordecai who essentially translated it so that they could read it. Written in the name of the king, sealed with his ring, same kind of thing as before with Haman, and sent out with riders on swift horses. There's a lot of emphasis, as you notice, a lot of emphasis on the horses. Speed is of the essence. It's the, the horses, the royal horses from the royal stud, and they rode them fast. You know, there's this urgency that this gets out. The message, message must get out fast, saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy and kill and annihilate, same language as Haman's edict toward the Jews, against the Jews, to destroy, kill, and annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods on one day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus um, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, the same day uh, as, the, as the other. And so the 11 and 12 have the upshot of, of that decree. The, the, this designed then to counter the, uh, the decree of Haman. They can't get rid of that one, so what do they do? They have a decree that says the Jews have the right to defend themselves against any armed force that attacks them. They're allowed to defend themselves with the king's blessing. On March 7th of the next year, Haman's intended doomsday for the Jews. Now, some people have been troubled by the, the violence of the language here. Uh, some things to notice. First of all, uh, it was in self-defense. They were given the right, with the king's blessing, to defend themselves against anyone who attacks them. Uh, they were able to destroy, kill, and annihilate, same language as Haman's decree, uh, anyone who attacked them. <clears throat> There's also the language here, women and children included. Whose women? Whose children? Which women? Which children? Uh, it is a little bit ambiguous, and the ESV preserves that ambiguity. Uh, do they have the right to kill those who attack them, uh, women and children included? Or <clears throat> do they have the right to, uh, to defend them against those who attack them or the Jewish women and children. So in other words, are, this, are these the, the Persian women and children attackers who would be killed? Or is this the women and children of the Jews who might be attacked and therefore could be, could be defended? You see the ambiguity. Which women, which children? The Jewish ones or the Persian ones? Uh, it's kind of hard to tell. The NIV actually puts it more uh, favoring that... Um, that this is, they defend their own women and children. It's those who attack them, Jewish men, or also Jewish women and children. But it may be a little more natural to understand it, that the Jews have the right to, to fight back against and destroy anyone who attacks them, including the women and children of those who attack them. I do think that probably is more the sense. The ESV 
as it's, it's kind of its translation philosophy, leaves it ambiguous. So you have to decide. You have to figure it out. Um, hard to say. Uh, it may be the other, but um, the point is, though, that the Jews are able to protect themselves against those who attack them by fighting back, either against Persian women and children or those who attack the Jews, including Jewish women and children. So the edict ordering the destruction of the Jews couldn't be changed, but this new edict, very similar to the first one, gives the Jews royal authority to defend themselves to the full extent possible, and it would be violent. I mean, this, if someone violently attacks them, they have the right to fight back. And so this, this law, this new edict, is on the books now as well. So they both are in play, both are in effect. Uh, Ian Duguid in the Reformed Expository uh, Commentary Series, it's really good on Esther, uh, he puts it this way. He says, this was not merely self-defense, but neither was it a license for indiscriminate slaughter. The verb used in verse 13 to describe the action for which the Jews are to be prepared is nakam, which always indicates punitive retribution for a prior wrong. Those who, like Haman, sought to destroy the seed of the Jews in accordance with his edict would themselves share Haman's fate. The authority of the empire now backed up the threats of the Abrahamic covenant against those who sought to harm the descendants of Abraham. However, it was the Jews themselves who would have to carry out the sanctions of the covenant in a kind of holy war against their enemies. He goes on at length talking about that concept of holy war what you see with Joshua, you see against the, the evil Canaanites with the, with the uh, going into the promised land. And remember, part of the covenant with Abraham, and the Lord said to Abraham, is those who curse you, I will curse. And we talked last time about Haman hanged on a tree, hanged on that gallows, or impaled on the pole, whichever it was, falls under that curse. He had attacked the Jews, he had attacked the descendants of Abraham, and therefore he had attacked God and was hanged and experienced covenant curses. Cursed is he who hangs on a tree. Uh, Paul picks that up in Galatians with Jesus, hanged on the, on the cross, crucified, uh, and bearing the curse that belongs to us. Well, now this goes to all of these who would attack the Jews to bear the covenant curse that falls upon them uh, now with the king's authority, but as, as Duguid says, the, the Jews would have to enforce those sanctions of the covenant themselves. And this is important to see because this is not, this is not uh, in any way uh, giving us warrant to ignore what the Bible says about, uh, about not returning evil for good. This is, this is something Duguid adds I think is important to hear. He says, Haman's edict against the Jews was not merely a matter of personal animosity. It was an expression of the age-old enmity between the Amalekites and God's people. That connection is underlined for us twice in this text by the designation of Haman as the Agagite, descendant of King Agag. Uh, we just talked about that. And he said even in Saul's time, the conflict between the Israelites and the Agagites had already, by that time, been a long-standing enmity. So in a sense, this is kind of a continuation of that warfare between Israel and uh, the Amalekites that's playing out now in, among the uh, dispersed Jews in Persia. So this isn't just personal vendetta, but the playing out of an antipathy. And I would suggest it goes even, even much earlier than Saul and Israel and the Amalekites with King Agag. It goes back to Genesis 3, where the Lord says, I will put enmity, I will put hostility between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And you trace that, that hostility through the scriptures and certainly see that being played out now. I mean, behind Haman and behind those of Persia who might attack the Jews, you hear the hiss of that serpent. And you see, you see the, the malice of Satan against God and against his people. So there's something cosmic going on here in Persia with the Jews that Esther and Mordecai are involved in, 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 in where Satan would seek to, to wipe out large numbers of God's people there in the Old Testament. And the Lord in his providence brings about a situation where they can protect themselves. But more broadly than this, 
you and I today can rest assured that God's judgment will fall on all those ultimately who oppose God, who oppose us, who oppose the people of God, the church, Jew and Gentile in the world today. That day of judgment is coming. We would, we would prefer they, uh, they join our side and be saved. But for those who don't, they oppose God and they will come under his judgment because to oppose God's people is to oppose God. Saul of Tarsus found this out when Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. Remember, he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Well, Jesus was in heaven. But what he meant was, by persecuting my people, you are persecuting me. And Haman wasn't just attacking the Jews. Haman was attacking God. And as anyone who attacks God does, Haman lost badly. Esther was uh, an unusual and unique situation in the, in the Old Testament. And in the personal context, though, Scripture does tell us in the New Testament not to avenge ourselves, to leave room for God's wrath. We need to make sure, yes, that we can defend ourselves using, using lethal force if necessary. And we certainly would want to take full protection of the laws of our, of our state or city or country for our own protection. Uh, but we also want to be careful that it doesn't just turn into personal malice or a desire for revenge. Uh, even being willing, uh, depending on the circumstances, to absorb wrong done to us and leaving the vengeance and the justice to God. So Esther's willingness here. Uh, first, the first time she went to the king and the king held out the scepter, and now the second time. Also, before we move on, just to point out... Um, I don't know if you'd say Esther is a type of Christ here, but I think she certainly demonstrates the same spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ in her willingness to risk it all for the sake of her people. Her willingness to go before the king, not knowing how he would react. And remember, Xerxes could be volatile and violent and unpredictable. I mean, she truly was taking her life in her hands to approach the king as she did. And even this second time, although more reassurance this second time that the king is favorable to her, but her willingness to lose her comfortable life, the palace, the money, the prestige, the position, to lose all of that for the sake of the safety and the lives of her people. You can even think of how Hebrews describes Moses who left the house of Pharaoh to live in the wilderness. He'd rather identify with the people of God and suffer with the people of God than to enjoy the treasures of Egypt. Lester is in that, that strain. But of course, ultimately, the Lord Jesus Christ, who didn't just risk it all, he intentionally, knowingly gave it all up for us, for his people, that we would be saved, that we would be safe that we might be delivered through his blood, through his righteousness, which we uh, sang of earlier, the blood that atones for our sins and the righteousness that provides us with that positive righteousness of God, the righteousness Jesus himself earned in his perfect obedience in this world. So we are delivered by his blood for us, his righteousness credited to us. And so we see Esther's plea, uh, again, putting it all on the line in an effort to save her people. And then the last thing, you see Jewish joy. Third, there's Jewish joy. 15 and 17, 15, 16, 17 kind of ends where we started in verses 1 and 2, a, a good situation, uh, a lot of joy. Uh, three entities here uh, in light of this new edict. One is Mordecai, and Mordecai <clears throat> is dressed. Mordecai goes out in royal linens, Robes of blue, white, purple, got a crown on his head, uh, wearing ro these royal robes, uh, beautiful clothes, expensive clothes. Uh, remember that happened when, when, when Haman was ordered to go out and parade him about wearing the king's robes. Well, now Mordecai's wearing them uh, in earnest in his own role as, as essentially prime minister. And notice the reaction. All Susa shouts and rejoices. They love Mordecai. And not just the Jews, apparently, the, the Persians. Mordecai was a popular man, a liked man. It does seem like the city of Susa was very glad to see Haman gone and Mordecai in his 
place. But notice this too. All Susa shouted and rejoiced. But unlike with Haman, the king didn't have to tell people to do it. This was spontaneous. Remember, they were under king's command to bow to Haman. Uh, there didn't need to be a king's command for people to rejoice at the presence of Mordecai. So apparently they really liked Mordecai. We're glad to see uh, what happened and probably glad to see Haman get his comeuppance and be rid of him. So first entity here is Mordecai. Second is the Jews. Notice it says the Jews of Susa. Remember that's the, the citadel city. That's where we are. Uh, had light and gladness and joy and Honor. And then verse 17 says, Among Jews throughout the empire there was gladness and joy, a feast and a holiday. You would be forgiven for thinking Haman's edict was revoked or lifted altogether. But it wasn't. It was still in place. But now they had royal authorization to defend themselves, to fight back. And so now at least there was hope. The problem was not gone. But there was hope. And so there's this rejoicing. So one was Mordecai, two is the Jews, and three the Persians. And it's 17, the, the very end. And many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. This kind of tells you that the Jewishness was rising in Persia. It was now seen to be uh, advantageous, or at least safe, to identify as a Jew. That's, that's kind of odd, well, but a statement made by Haman's wife, Zeresh, might explain some of this. Remember back in chapter 6, after Mordecai's, uh, or rather, after Haman's humiliation, having to parade Mordecai around as the man whom the king delights to honor, uh, that his wife says to him, Haman's wife says to him, if Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. Now, whether that's a memory of how the Lord gave the Jews victory in unlikely circumstances going into Canaan and the Promised Land and other things, the, 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 um, the Exodus, the Red Sea, or whether it's, it, it may also have included a superstition about the Jews or this kind of this weird fear of them. But she makes that statement, and she proved right. You will surely fall before him. But apparently this sentiment became widespread, not just for Mordecai, but for all the Jews. They feared the Jews. Who are these people? Things seem to go their way. Remember, God's not mentioned. All they're seeing is the circumstances and that the Persians are pagans. Uh, and yet they see things going Mordecai's way, going the Jews' way. And so some of them at least start thinking, well, if he can't beat them, join them. Clearly, they thought the Jews were on the ascendancy, that they were on the winning side. And they wanted to Join them, at least in name. Yes, I'm Jewish, uh, or maybe actually full proselytization, uh, undergo circumcision, become Jewish, uh, but at the very least claim to be Jews. Uh, sadly, you kind of saw a, a similar dynamic when Constantine, the emperor of Rome, became Christian. Suddenly being a Christian was in vogue, and lots and lots of people identified as Christians, whether they were or not. And while that was in some ways a help, it was also in some ways a disaster for the Christian church, because now everybody wanted to be a Christian, whether they were or not. Today, I mean, as Christians, we would certainly love people to join us, not because they fear us, although some might have all kind of weird ideas about Christians, but because that they would want what we have, that they would see what we have, the knowledge of God, joy, community, life, and they would say, I want what you have and would want to join us, just as the Jews, uh, as the Persians back in those days, began claiming to be Jews, maybe out of fear, but we would want people to do it out of a desire to have what we have, to see Christians, and to say, that's what I want, that's what's missing, that's what I don't have. So here in this passage, uh, it ends on a very high, joyful note. The issue is, is not yet settled, and that'll come in the next chapter, but things are looking up for the Jews, and even the non-Jews recognize it. Um, is this not what it is to live the Christian life? That Jesus has won the decisive battle for us through his own death and resurrection, and yet we still live in a fallen world. 
There is still sin and opposition outside us. There's even sin and opposition from our own still fallen, not yet glorified hearts. Uh, So we fight the good fight of the Christian life. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, ultimately, but against principalities and powers. But it is a fight. It is more of a fight because it's not just against people, but against dark spiritual powers. So there are struggles. There are tears ahead. Yet, the outcome is already known. The outcome is secure. And so like the Jews of Esther's day, we are filled in Christ with light and gladness and joy, and honor. Let's pray. Father, we bow before your amazing providence as we read Esther and see, Lord, uh, unmentioned, invisible, and yet very much at work. But the same is true today. We may not see you, Lord, but you are there. You are at work. You are causing things to happen the way you want them to happen for your glory and for our good. Father, we know in this world there will be tears, there will be loss, there will be pain, there will be hurt. Father, enemies within and without, and yet Jesus is one. Jesus rose from the dead. Lord, we will be with him. Our bodies will be raised up to live in the new heavens and new earth. Thank you, O God. Give us grace to fight against sin within. Uh, Lord, to strive for purity and holiness, to reflect who we are in Christ. And Father, help us to live individually and uh, as a community of believers in such a way that it would be attractive Lord, to those in this world, that they would want to have what we have and to join us in what we have. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.